SCORE is a nonprofit, and we uh, we do get uh, funds from government, from corporations, and from uh, foundations. So as we go through, I'll try to blend in our SCORE experience with uh, you know the more uh, uh, general uh, comments, and so maybe that'll um, be more realistic to you. Uh, my uh, uh, colleagues, uh, Anita here today has a lot of uh, nonprofit experience, in, particularly in writing grants and managing, uh, uh, you know, nonprofit organizations. And she'll be uh, leading the uh, seminar on Thursday. I think taken together, the, this funding today, which is a little bit generic, and then how to write grants, which is very specific on that topic should be uh, very uh, interesting. And I could tell you that at least Anita and myself are very uh, experienced. Now I do notice we have one more panelist just joined us, uh, Greg Friedman. He also has decades of experience in nonprofits uh, and he has a unique perspective being uh, on the board of the Zoological Society and he is also had a lot of experience not only applying for grants, but uh, uh, you know reviewing grants. So in tonight tonight's session and in Thursday's session, please feel free to ask Anita, Greg, or myself any questions that you would have. And uh, and, and as Anita mentioned, uh, to get in, into real detail, ask for a mentor you'll probably end up with one of the three of us, although we have a few others that do nonprofits. And we would uh, really look forward to working with you to make your nonprofit a success. So uh, with that, uh, we'll get into the next slide, Anita, which is- I hope the, so. <laughs> Let me see if I can open it. Oh. Um, it doesn't wanna move. There we go. There we go. Now, what we're going to talk about is uh, individual donations, where to look for funding opportunities, and how to identify opportunities, uh, and what are the current hot things like crowdfunding and donation pages. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the need for fundraising. Uh, most startup nonprofits, small uh, uh, organizations really downplay the need for fundraising. They may consider that their own time is going to be what the effort takes, but uh, to get it going. But really, uh, you, you need help. At least 50% of time and effort should go to fundraising, and, and particularly if you do not have the ability to charge service fees. We'll talk in, the, uh, in subsequent slides about service fees. Uh, for example, uh, SCORE does not charge service fees. This seminar is free. Our mentoring is free. That is our brand. We provide free unlimited mentoring and workshops. Uh, but on the other hand, you have costs. And just like any other business, we have to have sufficient funds in order to survive. Next slide, please. Now, where do you get the funds? Now, in if you look at all nonprofits throughout the country, and it's a huge number with very large uh, database, 47% of them depend on uh, service fees and sales of goods. And I'll give you examples in the next slide. 25% uh, comes from government contracts for services. We at SCORE get about uh, government revenue from the SBA, we get about a third of our revenue. Uh, charitable giving accounts for less than 25% of nonprofit income. That's on the average. There are many nonprofits that's 100% charitable given and, and others would be 100% uh, government contracts. So there's a huge range in style of fundraising. Next slide. Now, for fee for service. Uh, now, these are very well known. Probably will surprise you that these people are Nonprofits, hospitals, they bill patients, museums, ask for admission fees, and uh, annual uh, 
um, memberships. Theaters sell tickets and annual memberships. Civic organizations charge dues. Colleges require tuitions. And of course, uh, ask for money from all alumni or parents. And Next slide. Bob? Yes, sir. The NFL and the N National Rifle Association are both nonprofits. And they get a lot of fees for service. Yes, so they do. The NFL does. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, you know. Yes. Popping in there. Yeah. Well, the point is, nonprofits is a huge category, and nobody knows really how many nonprofits there are because you, you could find out how many are 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 uh, are approved or set up by, by the IRS. Those are 501c3s, but it's a huge number of less uh, official nonprofits that are registered in the state or just exist like a Kool-Aid stand uh, in the neighborhood. Now, a, a good example of fee-for-service is Girl Scout cookies. Uh, or organizations sell T-shirts, mugs. Uh, NPR, WBIZ has annual auction. Many nonprofits have balls or dinners where admissions include a sizable donation, uh, 5K runs, 10K walk. These are just common ways to get fees, get, to get uh, income. Now, all these organizations that do these kind of uh, fundraising will be chair. They'll uh, people who buy these often will look for a charitable donation. Now, on the other hand, Girl Scout cookies, you just buy them, you don't bother about a tax deduction for that. Next slide. Now, in uh, individuals are the largest source of charitable contributions. In fact, and, and that's a surprising statistic that actually 68% of, of charitable giving uh, comes from individuals as opposed to foundations or corporations or bequests. Uh, and the, the key to any of these is, is that, and I mentioned have a 1C3, uh, has, you have to get that designation from the IRS. And, and uh, without that, individuals, corporations, foundations cannot uh, deduct uh, their donation and therefore they won't give them. It's almost impossible if you don't have a 501c3 to get major donations. Um, it's just the fact of life. Now, when it comes to individual don uh, donations, uh, we call it the Pareto principle. About 20% of donors give about 80%. And you, your job is to identify uh, not who's giving you the, the minimum amount, but who's really giving you the opportunity for the maximum amount. And you must communicate with them and they, they must be driven uh, by their passion for your cause. And you must uh, make sure they know the impact of, of their donations. Uh, that's a big part of when we say 50% of the time uh, working on fundraising, it's communications. It's really a marketing job. Uh, you have to be donor focused. You have to ramp up those communications. You have to be grateful and provide regular updates on funding and needs. Uh, and this, you have to customize that. You have to understand who your donors are. Uh, very few donors don't want to hear back from you. They want to know, are they, are, you, are they making a difference in your organization? Next slide. Now, when, when you, you go uh, to individuals, and frankly, you have to, whether you're going to foundation or corporation, et cetera, you have to have a budget projection. You have to have financials. Many, many... Uh, Organizations will require a couple of years of your finances, want to know what your budget is, and, and uh, they want to know where the money is going to be used. Um, now, for example, SCORE, uh, I use that as an advantage. We provide like 6,000 services a year that last year for a budget of only 35,000. In our budget, I will easily say it only goes to two things, marketing and our admin assistant for, to help us. All the rest is volunteer work. 
I use that as an advantage because that's a very low amount of money and it's a very effective, cost-effective way uh, for people to give money and get bang for their buck. Now, this is an interesting point, point number two about COVID-19. Uh, you really have to look at your, your how both from where you're getting money and your own operations. What is the impact of COVID? Uh, you have to buy, revise your budget. Now, I'll give a score example. Now, this works to our advantage. Since COVID happened, we have basically doubled our mentoring and reduced our costs because we're not, we close the office and we're doing, uh, not doing in-person workshops. So our costs are down, but our services are up. So I'm telling people we're much more cost effective. And it's a fact, and you have to get show that data uh, that, that you're more cost effective. Now, the other problem with COVID-19 though, is that many of the more traditional sources of funds uh, have turned their priorities to those organizations that are most impacted by COVID-19. And they're not uh, like, for example, Cleveland Foundation's not even, as far as I know, not even looking at any new uh, grants for new people. They're dealing with survival of their existing nonprofits. So as you probably are aware, COVID-19 is killing not only small businesses, uh, but most many nonprofits right now. And uh, how you change, everybody you'll talk to for funding is gonna say, well, how do you change? And how are you gonna, how are you gonna help recover from COVID-19? Uh, that makes it very difficult for some of the uh, uh, nonprofits, particularly in the arts and, uh, you know, in humanities area that don't really, uh, in, you know, not economic, uh, they're more artistic than they are economic development. Now, the third point is you just have to make donor recruitment and fundraising a high priority. Here it says dedicate a staff at least one half-time person that may be an average. Uh, I probably spend half my time at, at SCORE working on fundraising uh, and it's constant. You cannot say, well, I'm gonna do it in January. It doesn't work. You do it every week of the year. You go back to your, your list, you make new lists, you go back, it's re repetitive. It goes back to what I commented on before. It's called marketing and marketing means you have to get to know the target audience. You have to sell your story and you have to be consistent and repetitive and a little bit pain in the butt to them. Because sometimes they'd rather, rather than you call the fifth or sixth time, they might give you a few thousand dollars to go away. So <laughs> that's fine. That's happened to me several times. Okay, one of the things going on now is uh, crowdfunding. Now, you, the next slide will give you some of the sources. By the way, um, I don't think I need to mention it, but all slides will be available to you. Uh, they'll be sent out. And I believe this is recorded, Bob. Yes. Uh, uh, and it, okay, so you, it, it is recorded and the slides will be sent. So you don't have to try to be a scribe when we get to some of the subsequent slides that have a lot of uh, links to them. Yes, yeah, so, so we will send out a link to the recording as well. So crowdfunding is, uh, you know, there, there's several types of crowdfunding, but the crowdfunding we're talking about here is, is you have a cause. And sometimes, you know, it, it, a tragedy occurs. So you, you have a goal. I, I, we have to help this family who's been impacted by a fire. Well, you set a goal, you tell the story, and you give it pictures and video, video is always great. And you seek help and you're looking for general donations. Uh, next slide, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, you, you need uh, to have a database to send this out to, you, you need an email database, you send texts, emails, so you have to use social media. And, and when you get any donations, you gotta thank them. And of course, you, you will withdraw funds from the platform that you use. I think the next slide shows the platforms. You're right. Now, if you are interested in using crowdfunding, 
here's one, two, three, four, five, six, you could follow up with. Uh, they're free to use, but they're gonna take a cut, usually three to 5%, you know, that, that, that'll vary. And you gotta look at the fine print of, <coughs> and what that is, excuse me. Um, but, you know, you gotta have a real good cause. And, and the problem is with, uh, if you have a, a family that's gone through a tragedy that you wanna help and you set up a nonprofit and you use crowdfunding, that's a very local scenario. And it doesn't do any good to broadcast to California or to New York if you're looking for help for somebody in Cleveland Heights. Um, you might get some, but it's a very low probability of help there. Next slide. Now, uh, another area that nonprofits overlook and uh, is implement a legacy gift program. And that is donors, financial and estate planning um, can build in your, your, your charity. And, and I personally participate in, in the first one, IRA, RMDs, required minimum distribution. Once a person is 70 and a half years old and has an IRA, the government requires them to withdraw a certain amount every year. Uh, and there is a, a uh, scenario where if you donate that withdrawal, well, let's say you have to withdraw $10,000 a year. If you donate that 10,000 to charities, then you don't have to pay tax on that 10,000 income. So uh, it's a very effective way and all you do is whoever does your IRA, you instruct them to pay that directly to a charity. Uh, it's very efficient. Unfortunately, COVID is knocked out 2020. Now we're almost done with 2020. So if you wanted to, to ask people to do it this year or do it yourself this year, you can't do it because that, uh, that program was suspended. But I believe it'll be back in in 2021, at least that's what I'm told. Now I go ahead, Greg. Uh, I believe yeah. that also you can use this money for funding 529 programs for education for children or significant others. Okay. Okay. The next one is is just a more sophisticated. Uh, the first one, IRA, RMD, is rather informal that you direct it. A QCD, Qualified Charitable Distribution, you work with your financial institution and you set it up uh, with guidelines and they'll see to it that X amount is there um, for that. Now, when you're seeking funds, uh, donations, you're looking for people who have IRAs and who have significant retirement assets. And you, 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 they may not know that uh, they can contribute that to charities and get a tax deduction. Or tax, it's not a tax deduction. It's, it's eliminate their, the tax ability or the taxation on the RMD itself. If there's any questions on that, I'll be glad to answer at the end uh, because I've been doing that for eight years, nine years. Um, the other legacy gift is uh, and you'll see this in schools, uh, like I get probably once a month from Case, where I'm a graduate of Case alumni, uh, put us in your will, you know, <laughs> have, have uh, our school or my, you know, as a beneficiary, this, this, you know, and a lot of people do that, and you know, particularly schools do that, but any charity can do that, you know, just say, put us in your will, and uh, that, that, that's a great way to get a nice hunk of money when when, uh, the, you know, uh, a person dies. The only that, problem with that is you never know when you're going to get it. <laughs> that's right. And it's a one shot. Yep. And Anita, that, that's totally correct. <laughs> because I've done some work with the Cleveland Zoological Society where they anticipated getting a donation on a charitable distribution or by a will and it was deferred. Mm. So, you know, 
Yeah, you can't count on it, is what Greg and Anita are saying. Yeah. Well, but you can it's, count I, on it. it it's a windfall. Count on when. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. It, it's a, I look at it as a windfall if it happens, but you can't count on it in terms of your budget in, uh, in short term. Right. Now, granting sources, we're going to go into all these uh, uh, in the next slides. And rather than read them here, let's take the next slide. The first one is uh, corporate giving programs. Uh, this is really a, uh, once you get into these, it, it's a great source of fund your uh, nonprofit. Uh, many companies match the donations made by the employer, employees. And um, many times, employee doesn't even know that the company matches. So you as seeking funds have to ask the employee, would you check with your employer to see if they match? And it's not always one-to-one. -one. It could be 50-50 uh, or 25. It doesn't matter. It's free money. And, um, you know, that's a great, great asset. Score, uh, right now, we're getting it from IBM. Um, we get uh, donations. And, and I, in the past, in Pennsylvania, we had a number of companies like ConocoPhillips that would annually give uh, donations uh, matched by the uh, uh, member. Now, volunteer grant programs. Many companies also uh, will match the time that employees donate to your organization by volunteering. Uh, you know, the, a lot of banks encourage their employees, accountancies to, to uh, volunteer. Many companies do. And so if you need volunteers, uh, you have to find out which ones have that uh, capability. Uh, other donations, you know, many companies just support nonprofits through other programs or individual policies. And you have to look through it. And there's no list of, of these companies, but you, you really just got to go and start knocking on doors at companies and find out, do you support nonprofits? Uh, they may do it through a foundation, but they also may do it through their community development or just, uh, you know, general funds. Bob, Next. KeyBank sure. and PNC do a lot of work with doing the volunteer <laughs> grant program. Yep, yep, very true. Uh, now, this is, is some data on matching. Uh, there, there's somewhere between four and ten billion dollars uh, is these it's are unclaimed per year where corporations say they ma they'll match if their employ the catch here is their employees don't ask for it and they don't make donations themselves so we have to educate the people the donor uh, as to matching programs 65 percent of fortune 500s have the matching um, and, and, you know, you'd see the rest of this data, two to three billion a year are donated through matching gifts. And uh, the cool thing here is that it, if a, it, a person knows that his uh, employee, employer is going to match, he'll even give more so that the number gets bigger. At least that's what the statistics say. Um, so it, it's really a, a very synergistic program that you got to look into. Next slide. Here's some uh, names of matching gift companies, General Electric, BP, Gap, ExxonMobil, Johnson & Johnson, Microsoft. Uh, next slide, it's more. Uh, Pfizer, Pfizer is probably going to make a lot more money now. Coca-Cola. IBM, now we do get funds. They have uh, two or th three times over the last few years from IBM and I have in the past, uh, not only here in Cleveland, but I've gotten in Pennsylvania from IBM. So anybody that worked at IBM uh, should have access to their matching uh, uh, funds. American Express, okay. Now foundations. Uh, now, this is something that SCORE certainly focuses on. Uh, many private foundations exist solely to better society by supporting nonprofits. I'll give you two examples, Cleveland Foundation and the Lorain County Community Foundation. They, they are made up 
of uh, they're sort of agglomerators of private donations that people will give and they carry out because they get a lot more money if other people don't, if everybody donates to them. And then they have their priorities and they can do an awful lot of good by generating a lot of money. Cleveland Foundation is one of the largest uh, private foundations in the country and one of the first, and we should be very proud of it. Um, now, some foundation will provide startup funding to new nonprofits, but that's pretty doggone rare. And you really gotta knock on a lot of doors to find that. Um, and if they say they are open, boy, you gotta do a lot of work with them uh, to convince them that you're gonna be around in more than a year and that it's worth, your mission is worth them uh, supporting. And, and, and uh, Bob, on that one, you need to make sure you have a business plan and they're going to ask you for a lot of information. And right, you better and that's the slide that's up. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Cover <laughs> I, letter, a business I'm plan, ahead. a mission, and uh, you got to pre be prepared. They, uh, it, it's a tough sell, even if you're not a uh, startup and all these things are required. Uh, I think, First time I started working at for get funds from Cleveland Foundation, uh, it took seven meetings, eight or nine drafts of these things. And they kept coming back with constructive criticisms, and uh, you know we worked it because we figured out what they wanted. And one of the most important things they want, and I suspect every foundation is, what is your plan for, for continuity? How are you, you know, how long do you think you'll be in business? Uh, and what assurance can we, you give us that you'll be not a, a one-shot deal? Now, this last uh, uh, bullet is very important, and I alluded to it prior, a lot of foundations now, a lot of nonprofits have been affected by COVID-19. Uh, and what foundations are trying to do is prioritize their money to allow a number of the nonprofits to survive. Um, you know, for example, Cleveland Food Bank is, is in de you know, desperate need uh, right now. And so Many of the major Cleveland area foundations are upping the uh, their uh, donations to Cleveland Food Bank, but cu cutting others. And so, as a fundraiser, such as Gore, such as you folks who are on this call, <coughs> it's a very <coughs> extremely difficult time if they don't know you, or if they don't know your mission, and don't feel you're critical. Uh, here's a list of top private corporations. Uh, number three is Wells Fargo. Uh, we do, one of our largest uh, donors is the Wells Fargo Foundation. And it's for the general economic welfare of Northeastern Ohio. Uh, it's interesting, they do not allow us to uh, advertise uh, the partnership they want it to go to economic development and it's not in any way publicizing Wells Fargo. It's purely uh, for the benefit of the economic good in the community, Northeast Ohio community. Okay, so this list you'll, you'll have. Um, now the, the uh, definitive source to find out grant programs and, and endowments. It's Catalog of Federal Domestic Assistance. Uh, and you'd have to slog through it to find out what's available, um, applicable to your nonprofit. Now, uh, Search Grants is another one. It's with, within grants.gov and it's found at, uh, at their website. Next slide is, uh, Couple of the, uh, you know, the nonprofit grant programs and endowments uh, for 
for non, we'll call them human service, but more for the art, the National Endowment for Arts. Uh, that's a great organization that gives grants. Uh, same thing for National Endowment of Humani uh, Humanities at EH. <coughs> um, these, uh, both these have been really impacted by COVID because a lot of people uh, uh, aren't donating to them right now and they have a limited uh, grant program. Um, but you know, we're, we're optimistic we're getting out of this. So, but these are great sources of you are in uh, social, historical, literary arts, uh, creative arts, uh, you know, those are your go-to uh, organizations. Next. Hey, Bob. Yes, sir. One thing I've noted is that during these troubled times, many donors have been willing to change their donation from restricted to unrestricted funds to help keep the not-for-profit running. And I think that's a very critical thing that needs to be considered. So if you have restricted funds available to you, contact the donor and see if you can get that restriction released. Yeah, I, I didn't mention restricted funds, but let me go a little bit more uh, into detail on that. Many foundations and, and corporations will have guidelines, not guidelines, restrictions, hard rules that you could only use the money X, Y, or Z. Uh, and what Greg's saying is under COVID scenarios, they're becoming a little bit more limited or, or liberal in the application. Now, uh, but you have to be very, you brought up a good issue, Greg. You have to be very aware of these restrictions uh, because I'll give you an example for SCORE. Um, Cleveland Foundation gave us money to re recruit members and recruit clients in only Cuyahoga County and Lake County. But our organization is seven counties. So we have to set up the, pro the accounting process to make sure the money is spent only where they said it could be spent and on only what they said it could be spent. Ideally, you do not want restricted funds. You want unrestricted funds. But, but beggars sometimes can't be choosy and you'll take the funds uh, where you can get it and, uh, and have to follow the rules. And if you don't follow the rules, you'll never get funding from that organization again. Uh, and I think when we talk about grant writing uh, on Thursday, Anita, we'll probably go into that a little bit more the issue of restrictions. Uh, state and city governments, they all have uh, grants right now. Uh, not all, but most do. For example, if you're behind in rent uh, in Lakewood, there is a fund that you can get up to $7,000. You have to, but they're not widely publicized. You have to go to your, uh, look at your local, uh, um, municipalities website and see what may be out there. Um, there's a national education, uh, NAH state, uh, as opposed to the federal ones, they have resources and grants. And, and, um, and you got to look at searchable databases and filter them by your region and state. Uh, you know, we're basically Northeast Ohio focused and it, it isn't very difficult to find our seven counties, but we got a lot of municipalities and we have the state and we, uh, uh, so you have to really dig into all those for, uh, and see if there's money available for your particular nonprofit. Now this last um, link here is candid.org. I'm gonna comment, I think in the next slide on that. Uh, yeah, it's third down. Let me jump to third down. What, what Candid is, it, it has a database of all private foundations that give grants. Uh, the regional headquarters is in Cleveland, and I'm going to give you a valuable name, David Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S. 
anybody serious about fundraising through foundations should get to know David Holmes. He's the Cleveland lead for Candid. It used to be called Foundation Center. It was acquired about two years ago by Candid, but it is an incredible resource for nonprofits. They are partner score. Uh, we like to work with them. They work with over, I believe, 30,000 nonprofits in Northern Ohio. But they have a database of all private foundations. And the other thing they do is they, uh, they have classes, usually for a fee, how to write grants, how to use the databases, how to use your social media uh, more effectively. Uh, but <clears throat> anybody in Northern Ohio who doesn't work with Candid or know about Candid is not serious about fundraising through uh, foundations. Now, and go ahead. Bob, um, I mentioned this last week, but they can go out to grantspace.org backslash nonprofit startup, and that will give them a wealth of information of starting a not for profit if that's the stage you're in. Right. And that's uh, a can that's a candid supported website. Okay. And again, I'm gonna give the magic name, David Holm. Email him, get a hold of Candid, get in touch with him, ask him how, uh, or tell him what you're looking for, and he is just a uh, unbelievable resource to deal with on that subject. Uh, Cleveland um, and Cuyahoga County have uh, grant opportunities. You got, uh, you got. This is the website for Cleveland. There's another one for Cuyahoga County, and the one on the bottom here is for Ohio. Uh, the problem is right now uh, with COVID, they're pretty much in turmoil, and. Uh, if, if you got something that's going to help with COVID, you got a shot, but uh, it's a tough time right now. Next slide. Well, this is something that I haven't gotten into, but the 13 best small business grants for women. So they're listed. Uh, you could obviously follow up with them. Uh, you'll have them on a the slide. So if that's of interest for your woman-owned nonprofit or woman-run nonprofit or woman-focused nonprofit, Here's uh, uh, 13 names to work with. Next. It's about donation pages. Have you thought of having a donation page? Why have one? Ne next slide. Online donations is, you know, just like everything else online. All the, And this is a, another impact of COVID. We're doing so much more online. Um, Instead of, you know, going to brick and mortar stores or maybe doing your donations uh, in, in another manner, uh, it's easier to stay in the house and do everything online. The online revenue is increasing, online donations are increasing. And one of the interesting things is number three here, 38% of donors who donated online in 18 did it again, uh, that same nonprofit the next year. And I would bet this year it's gonna be 50 or so percent. Um, so those are growing and uh, online monthly giving grew by 40%. That was last year. It's gonna grow more than that. I'll bet it may go up 100% double. Uh, so that what does that mean? That means you need an online donation page on your website or section. So you have to create it. Uh, today, it's cru crucial for success of most nonprofits. Uh, so, you know, does your donation pay, if you have one, does it have features that engage the donor? Next. Here's what you don't want. A process that's too slow, many steps, asking them a lot of questions. You don't want it complicated. Uh, and if it doesn't work properly, you're dead. People have very, very um, small tolerance for cloggy, slow, bulky web pages, particularly donations, because it's your money you're gonna donate 
And if it's not an easy process, uh, they're gonna say the hell with you. The, ne the next page, please, the slide. Never force a donor to create an account in order to make a donation. It is just bad process. You have to make it just simple. They don't want it if to do an account that you're gonna, they're gonna ask for uh, too much personal information and people don't wanna do that. Next slide. What you do as opposed to don't, keep it concise, ask only what you need. Uh, if you have an, only a good reason for an extra field, try to keep it simple uh, and make sure your branding is consistent. It has to look like the rest of your site and have your logo on it. Uh, and you have to label everything. Uh, don't allow them to get confused and abandon the page because they don't come back. Next slide. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Oh, keep it simple. Uh, Make sure that, and this is a common problem. Whoops. Could you go back one, please? Okay, thank you. Make sure your page runs on multiple platforms. And uh, you have to test it on Microsoft, Google, Chrome, Firefox, iOS. Make sure it works well on, today it has to work on a smartphone, uh, not just on a laptop or a tablet. Uh, one of the biggest problems I see, and I'm, this is the time of the month that I make donations, is if I use my smartphone, I can't read a lot of the stuff uh, in the donation page of number charities. It's just too much fine print. Uh, and of course, it has to be secure if you're collecting data. Next. Now, mobile fundraising statistics. Uh, if you have a, a smartphone mobile device, uh, about 8% of the people click and look at it will actually donate. Um, but that number is up 50%. And I'll guarantee you in 2020, given COVID, those numbers are going to be much higher than that. Um, on the other hand, the people who have been doing it through desktop browsers uh, decreased. So more and more, that just means your mobile phone uh, web page donation page has to be perfect. And it has to be uh, very demonstrative of your need. Uh, now, it, it, the last bullet shows, on the other hand, uh, mobile givers don't give quite as much as tablet or desktop. I'm not going to really think through why that is, but that's the statistics. Uh, probably will change. Now, here's a few more tips about fundraising. Talk to other nonprofits similar to your own, particularly if you're not really into your nonprofit's not formed yet, talk to other people, reach out, ask on, in their early days, um, what was their strategy for getting uh, funding? And, and it usually comes down in, in my personal experience is you got to start with a few um, key Keystone donors uh, who really believe in your mission. If you look at SCORE, uh, one is SBA. Well, you'd say, of course, SBA is going to fund SCORE because we're developing small business. Well, but they're going to give us more or less depending on how we perform and how our communications are. So we have to take care of that relationship. And if you're looking at foundations, you got to look at at foundations that other people in the similar um, kind of nonprofit, where do they get funds from? Those are the people who are going to, because foundations, you know, for example, I thought I know a lot of executives at Sherwin Williams. We're going to go to Sherwin Williams and we're going to get money um, because I know uh, most of the top management. So I look up, their foundation only gives the childhood issue. Uh, childhood development uh, charities. They weren't gonna give it to uh, uh, score-like organizations, period. Didn't matter if I knew the CEO. Uh, so you've got, you've got to find like-minded organizations. Bob, okay. 
one of the yep. way one of the ways you can do this is to can contact contact the Stokes Library of part of the Clean Public Library and ask them to contact not for profits that have a similar mission that aren't operating in the, the same local area where you're at. Because you don't want to necessarily try and get information from people you're competing against. That's a good point. Good point. So and that, you, that, that is equally true if you're not in a non-private, any business. Any business. You, you need but, to know what similar businesses are doing. How did they get started? Who do they depend on? Uh, period. But the Stokes reason. Public Library librarians, they're professional business people, will be more than happy to help you, but you have to call them and schedule an appointment. Okay, and another issue, we were talking about 501c3 status uh, from the IRS. If some of you out there uh, do not have it yet and are planning to apply or have applied, you don't have to wait uh, until you get it. Uh, the IRS will grant you uh, sort of pending status and you can uh, tell your clients that you, your 501c3 is pending and be able to take advantage of that. But you gotta go through and get it. If for some reason it's uh, <laughs> rejected, you might have a problem there. Next uh, slide. Grand writing skills. Well, next, on Thursday, that's all we're gonna talk about. As a grant writer uh, myself, I've probably done uh, too many, 30, 40 grants. Uh, I get about one out of three, maybe successful. Uh, it's incredibly important to have that skill. And if you don't have it yourself or develop it, uh, there are organizations that, uh, and again, uh, Candid will recommend some to you. Who will do, there are people out there who will do it for fairly minimal fees. Uh, and can, but they won't know your business that well. My personal recommendation is you know your business better than anybody else. Your mission, your, what you want to accomplish. So it's not difficult to write grants. It's difficult to succinctly meet the uh, standards that any foundation or corporation is going to request because they'll give you 100 words or 300 words or whatever. Uh, they all differ and you got to really practice that. But that means you got to know what you're saying. You have to say uh, concisely what you need. And that's what we're going to talk about on Thursday. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, Candid, and, and it sounds like we're doing a pitch for Candid. I guess we really are. Uh, because they are local and they're very helpful. They have grant writing classes, uh, you know, probably every month, if not every two months. Next. Hey, Bob, I, I have a suggestion as well. Uh, if you haven't considered, you know, either on your board or as one of your volunteers, the possibility of finding somebody that's got grant writing skills would go a long way to help out. Great point. I think we made that last week. Uh, in starting up here, but that's a great point, uh, Bob. If, if, if in your nonprofit, you have nobody that's, that uh, uh, his, let's see if I can say this correctly. If you, you need somebody that has a grant writing experience because it's pretty tough and um, a pretty significant challenge to do it from the code start. So, it, you know, and that if you could at least, you might want to at least hire somebody to train you to how to do it. Next slide. Yeah, questions. So um, Tom Mayola um, had a comment that he sent to us panelists. I'm going to read it, Bob, and you can comment on it. It's um, regarding the matching programs. He knows PNC, and he probably suspects other um, organizations as well. You know, you have to apply to be on their finite list. 
and, um, in, you know, in order to get to a point where they'll consider matching, uh, you can contact HR departments uh, to, to get a form or whatever it is that they require in order to get there. Well, that, that's for the employee or the retired employee of that company. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, for, for us seeking funds, we, that, that's irrelevant. I mean, it's nice, we, it's nice for me to know, for example, uh, well, I'm going to use Key as an example, because Tom, I know Tom, <laughs> he used to work for, for, for uh, Key, I believe. No, he worked for PNC, so that's what he's talking about. <laughs> so he can go to PNC and ask that, but I, I, I don't, it doesn't do me a lot of good as, as the looking for funds at PNC. Um, for what my... we have to do, let me, let me be a little better at that. We have to know the members of our organization, where they work, and encourage them to go to their uh, current or past employers and, and see if they have matching programs. Uh, my, my suggestion, Bob, would be to go out to the website, like a, for PNC, and do a deep dive and drill down and it might be the corporate secretary or it might be some other person that's administrating the donations. But that's something, it takes work. Yeah, I, I don't know if you guys can hear me or not. I, I made yep. the suggestion because that's what I used to do when I worked for PNC, uh, uh, do the matching you know, double your budget, <laughs> but they had a list of these are the only folks, these are the only companies that you would be able to select to match. So, okay. but, the, but, you know, as a nonprofit, you could go to them and say, look, I'd like to be on your list. So your employees can donate to me and you'd match. That's a good point, point, Tom. So, um, Bob, I have opened up everybody's mic, allowing them to talk. Um, all you have to do is, if you want to ask a question, is unmute your mic and speak right up. We don't even need to wait for hands or any of that kind of stuff. So, so go ahead. And, and uh, I see Elaine, you're open your mic. Go ahead. Oh, I have no questions. I'm sorry. I apologize for coming in late. No problem at all. So Bob, there's a question from Carla. Uh, is yeah, it, it, I am. Yeah, is it true it's six or seven hundred dollars to file file a five hundred one c three? A great. Why don't you handle that one? Um, there's two kinds. There's, okay, there's a ten twenty three ez. Okay. And, and that's if you think you're going to have. Less than fifty thousand dollars in revenues a year. Less than fifty, okay. And there's a ten twenty three. I think the fees, respectively, are like two twenty nine and then like five ninety nine. Oh, yeah, okay. right. Yeah, right now they're two fifty and and six hundred. Um, right. They've reduced them uh, from eight hundred and four hundred. So. That's a good thing. Okay. Thanks, Amanda. So, so let's be clear. It's two hundred and fifty dollars to file what's called a <coughs> form EZ to get your five hundred one c three. That's right. for small or startup nonprofit. It's six hundred today if you have more than fifty thousand dollars in assets. Right. Yeah. Just anticipate. Yeah. One thing I will point out is that when you register in Ohio, please register as a nonprofit corporation rather than an LLC, because if you file as an LLC, you automatically have to fill out the long form and pay the $600. Okay. And, and Anita, from my experience, you most likely won't get the LLC. Um, you won't you you won't get the certification letter. Yeah, well, well we that's a good point. I think we 
I think we talked about that last week. There's very little reason for a nonprofit to have an LLC. Right. They get the same protection being a nonprofit corporation. Okay. Okay. Oh. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. So um, it looks like there's there's four or five mics that are unmuted. Um, uh, Anna Davidson, did you have a question you wanted to, to, to run by us? Um, not at this time, thank you. Okay, then if you wouldn't mind, just mute your mic. Um, how about Bob, Bob Cosgrove, have you got one? No, I don't. Okay. okay. Um, and Tom's already spoken. Any other questions out there? Just feel free to unmute your mic. I guess we've answered them all. Great. Well, thank you all for attending. Please remember Thursday, seven o'clock, uh, we're at grant writing and uh, Anita is a real pro at this. And uh, <laughs> please don't miss this. In a week from tonight uh, at seven o'clock, thank you to be operating uh, a nonprofit and how to really improve the efficiency of your organization. Okay, so we will look forward to seeing you all on Thursday and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Have a good night. Take care, everyone. Thank you.